Good afternoon, everybody. This is Andrew Bram. Thank you for joining me this afternoon for this week's webinar. As always, if you have a question, please raise your electronic hand, and you can find this hand on the left side of your screen in the participant box. When you click on that hand, it will indicate on the participant list that you have a question, and then you can simply type the question into the chat box, which is on the lower left-hand side of the screen. I will either be able to answer the question uh, after it's been typed in, or if I'm in the middle of describing and discussing a point, I will pause at a convenient break and you can uh, answer the question at that time. And as always, professional development hours will be emailed to you after the presentation to the email that you indicated while logging in to the website. Today we'll be talking about high levels of recycled asphalt pavement, or wrap, in asphalt concrete. We'll begin with the background, and we'll talk about what is wrap, and what is some um, numbers for wrap usage in the United States. We'll then talk about wrap in asphalt concrete. How is it used? What sort of properties uh, do we need to determine? And then also, what is the definition of high wrap? There's a lot of different um, numbers that have been thrown out, and we'll go through some documents describing those. We'll talk about some experience of using high wrap in the lab, focusing around the NCHRP report, which stands for National Cooperative Highway Research Program, and that's NCHRP report 752. And we'll also go over some reports from Florida and Illinois. Then we'll finish up by talking a little bit about using RAP in the field and revisit some NCHRP reports, go over a little bit of quality assurance and kind of best practices type concepts for using RAP in the field. And then we'll finish off with a very nice report from the state of Minnesota that surveyed a wide variety of jobs that had used RAP. So to begin with, what is RAP? It stands for Recycled Asphalt Pavement. And we're all very familiar with the fact that existing asphalt concrete roads do deteriorate, and they are in need of maintenance and rehabilitation. One way to do this is to mill off the existing asphalt surfaces. One example of that is called the mill and fill. That's a popular solution, where approximately two inches of asphalt concrete is milled off the surface of the pavement and then a new asphalt concrete layer is placed in, in the same location. One of the benefits to this technique is you don't need to worry about changing the elevation of the road. You don't have to worry about clearances under bridge, curb and gutter, lining up, those type of things, because you're taking away and replacing the same amount of material. Um, <clears throat> wrap is also generated by if a, a road is severely deteriorated and you would like to remove it completely, you can also take that asphalt material, process it, crush it, and that's another source of wrap. But the, the mill and fill is probably the most popular option of, of how we obtain wrap materials. Now are some uh, basic properties of wrap. Well, wrap consists of asphalt cement and aggregate. So when you take that asphalt material off the road, you have some sort of aggregate within the wrap, and then some sort of asphalt cement as well. The asphalt cement is often highly aged, and there's various different um, ways that that can happen. First, you can lose some of the oily compounds of the asphalt cement simply by volatility, which is the evaporation of those uh, components, or absorption into the aggregate. Also, because asphalt is um, exposed to the air naturally, you can have a lot of reaction with oxygen. So um, if you take a core of an asphalt pavement, often only the first half inch or even less of material is oxidized. And that's just because of exposure to the sun, to the wind, to traffic and elements and those type of things. Um, and below the, the, the asphalt surface is actually, in, or the asphalt material is actually in pretty good shape. But that very top, it, it's often highly oxidized. And then also, um, the molecules can actually start changing, and you get something called steric 
hardening. And that's where the molecules within the asphalt cement realign and the asphalt becomes harder. Another way you can look at this is looking at the components of asphalt cement. And two of the most important components are asphaltines and maltines. And as, ox or as asphalt cement oxidizes and as asphalt cement ages, the asphaltine content increases and the maltine content decreases. So these are all kind of working together in the field. And it explains why, over time, asphalt concrete roads uh, deteriorate and age. Now here are some numbers. As usual, I'm going. you can't uh, click on this link, the blue link that you see. If you download the PDF file after it's been posted, you can click on the blue link. But the, the blue link doesn't work in the Blackboard, Blackboard Collaborate software. So I'm going to cut and paste the link that you see in the presentation into the chat box so you are able to click on that link. This is a very nice report that was put out by the National Asphalt Pavement Association just last year in 2013 talking about the RAP usage in the United States. And you can see over the past, uh, well, the three years that this report had covered, 2009, 2000. 10 and 2011, the amount of wrap that has been used has increased uh, significantly. So the, the tons used in either hot mix asphalt or warm mix asphalt has gone from 56 million tons all the way up to 66 million tons. So that's gone up almost 20% in just a, a two-year period. And you can also see from this graph that the vast majority of the asphalt concrete that's milled up, the wrap material, is placed back into both uh, hot mix asphalt or warm mix asphalt material. Now there are a couple other, another significant one, relatively significant, is um, a lot of agencies put wrap into just aggregates, maybe like uh, gravel shoulders and those type of things, but you really use a lot, you lose a lot of value when you do that, which we'll see on the next slide. And then a, a very sm relatively small amount goes into cold mix asphalt some other usages. And something that we really like to see right here is that the tons that are landfilled are, are very small, um, from 0.1 to 0.3, depending on the year. But compared to the amount that's being reused, it's a very small amount. So lots of good information in this report, um, including the, the RAP usage. And this is a map of the United States showing the estimated average percent of wrap in either HMA or warm mix asphalt in 2011. And if you take all these numbers, the average is about 19.1%. So any given job that's going down in the United States contains approximately 20% of wrap, which is a really nice feature. And you can see it, it varies greatly from 1% in Wyoming all the way up to, looks like Michigan is on top at, at 36%. So lots of reuse for the, the wrap. And this is some economic justification. If you assume that you are able to um, extract 5% liquid asphalt out of any given ton of wrap, we have saved about 3.3 million tons of asphalt cement in 2011. And that 3.3 million tons is equal to approximately 19 million barrels. And if we assume a price of $600 a ton for asphalt cement, which changes on a, a daily basis, but $600 a ton, that's a savings of almost $2, two billion. So using that wrap and assuming that we're able to get 5% out of that wrap, 5% liquid asphalt out of that wrap, we saved about $2 billion in, in 2011. And another important thing to notice is that in this report, this is a continuation of the National Asphalt Pavement Association report, uh, they found that 88% of the contractors have excess wrap in 2011. So you can see down here, uh, the bottom of this slide is a picture of a wrap, a wrap stockpile in Northwest Arkansas. Well, 88% of the contractors say that they had wrap left over in 2011 to the tune of 6.3 million tons. So what more can we do in order to even more fully utilize this? One of the ways is to increase the wrap content of our mixtures. And you can see here another website, morewrap.us. This is a part of the wrap expert task group. And I've, I've put the link into the chat box. 
lots of good information um, from this task group, lots of good resources on that website, so you can um, spend some time there in order to extract more information. So that's just a, a really kind of brief overall background of, of what is RAP and just some numbers to go off of. And now we're going to transition to the use of RAP in asphalt concrete. But if anyone has any questions at this point, if you could please raise your electronic hand and type the question into the chat box, I'd be more than happy to answer it. There don't seem to be any questions at this point, so we'll move on. So the question that we're going to ask first um, for wrap in asphalt concrete is how is wrap actually used in asphalt concrete? Then we'll talk a little bit about determining the properties of wrap, how we can extract and recover the wrap, the definition of high wrap, and then also some potential concerns for wrap in warm mix asphalt. So these are kind of the points that we'll go over when talking about wrap in asphalt concrete. And I wanted to point out this picture on the right is a very nice example. A lot of times if we had the opportunity to tour an asphalt plant, we'll see these beautiful piles of, of highly processed, even sized wrap waiting to be used. This is just an example, though, of the, the different types of material that you could potentially get in a plant. This is a small patching job, but you can see the pieces are very large and uh, they're not processed at all. This material may end up going to an asphalt plant and that Either the asphalt plant or some sort of aggregate contract will need to further process it in order to get a more desirable material. So when we're thinking about wrap and how it's used in asphalt concrete, both components of wrap should be utilized, and that includes the aggregate and the asphalt cement. And when we do this, we're able to reduce the amount of new or virgin aggregate and asphalt cement in the design. What's very important, however, is that when we're doing our designs, we need to account for this older material, this wrap material, in the new design. So the aggregate needs to meet the physical properties, both the consensus and the source properties. And then also it's important to take the asphalt cement and analyze that asphalt cement to make sure that we understand what we're putting into the um, mixture. Now, asphalt cement off of wrap we talked about earlier is generally highly oxidized. It's a stiffer. It's gone through perhaps some steric hardening. It's lost some of those oily compounds. So sometimes you need to counter the stiff asphalt cement that's found in wrap. And you can do this in one of two ways. You can either use a softer virgin asphalt cement than what you would normally use in a mix. Or you could use some sort of recycling agent to soften harder asphalt cement. So you'll uh, notice in the lower left hand corner a question has been entered into the chat box and the question is from visual pavement inspection can we decide whether the surface can be usable as wrap? And thank you for that question. It's a very good question and I think the immediate answer is no. Um, I think that it's very important as you are using a material to understand the basic properties of that material. So understanding the uh, aggregate properties, the physical properties, and also understanding the asphalt cement is very important. Now that being said, if you're working with an agency who has pretty significant experience or if you're using or if you're working for a company that has pretty significant experience in working with wrap from an area and you know the history of a road, um, a lot of times you can anticipate what the properties will be. So if you're familiar with the local aggregates, if you're familiar with the local asphalt cement, and if you're familiar with the history of the road, you are able to take a good guess as to what the performance of that wrap will be. But I think uh, from a best practices standpoint, it's always important to be constantly evaluating your wrap in order to make sure you understand uh, the properties and the behavior of that wrap. But thank you for the question. Um, and kind of uh, a spur from that question is the fact that the variability of wrap is a concern. So uh, if you go down a roadway, you'll see a lot of the original pavement. You'll see patches. You'll see chip seals and all sorts of other activities going on. 
And those often change from one job to another, from one section to another. And depending on what you're um, going to mill up or what area you're going to actually take away and potentially process for wrap, you go through many different jobs that have been laid down anywhere from five to 25 years in the past. And it may have different materials and very different properties. Also, if you are going more than just the mill and fill, if you're going to mill down deeper or remove asphalt material deeper than just the surface, you can get into base, binder, and then, of course, the surface courses on top. But you can get down into these lower courses, and all of this material may be found in wrap piles. So when you're thinking about how can you process and how can you account for wrap for multiple projects, good stockpile management is absolutely necessary. With all, all aggregate sources, good stockpile management is necessary. You want to make sure you have a homogeneous stockpile. You want to make sure you're not getting segregation problems or uh, getting a lot of moisture trapped, especially in the, the lower core of the stockpile. But with wrap, this becomes very important because depending on where the wrap came from, it could have pretty significant different um, properties. So there's a couple different options you can go off of. One is you can continuously kind of blend your wrap stockpile. And you can do this using a front end loader or some sort of other piece of equipment. But so in general, on any given day, you have a homogeneous wrap source. Now, it could be a blend of many different projects. But if you take a scoop out of that with a front end loader, you can assume that it's one general uh, material. Now, if you're also uh, receiving a lot of wrap from a specific job, or you're consistently receiving the same wrap from the same area, then you can actually start separating your stockpiles from each source. But this, um, as, as uh, many people who are familiar with plants know, it's often difficult to get this kind of attention to detail in plants. There's limits to room and space and, and just what you can do. But if you do have a, a significantly large job and you're confident that the material is the same throughout the whole job, you are able to have separate stockpiles of a specific type of wrap. And also, when you're thinking about how can you understand what type of wrap that you have, you can, multi you can take samples of the wrap from multiple locations. You can take it from the roadway itself, and you'd want to take a core before you mill that roadway. That will let you understand what sort of layers you have and what sort of material you have within that pavement structure. A difficulty behind this, however, is that the milling machine processes the wrap. It breaks it down in some ways. And then if you're in a plant, a lot of plants also crush wrap in order to get certain sizes. And those two mechanisms, the milling mechanism and the crushing mechanism in the field, that could be very different than how you could break down a core in the laboratory. So how a wrap source is crushed and processed is also very important to recognize, is that can differ pretty greatly between the field and the lab. Um, if you are also interested in collecting wraps, uh, wrap samples and you don't collect it from a roadway, you can also take them from the haul trucks. You can see in the bottom of this slide, there's a haul truck being filled with wrap. You can simply take some samples from there. Or you can take it from the stockpile in the plant. And quite a few of the plants that um, I've been able to visit, they have an unprocessed wrap stockpile and a processed wrap stockpile. So they bring in the unprocessed material from all sorts of different jobs. Uh, they may not know. Uh, the sizes or the, the characteristics of it, but then they can process it, they can crush it, they can screen it, and they can develop a very consistent, high-quality product for their uh, job sites. So that's uh, that was talking a little bit about um, the the properties of the the wrap itself, and when you think about the one of the largest benefits of wrap, as we talked about previously is the asphalt cement or the asphalt binder that comes with the wrap. And how can we get this asphalt cement off of the wrap to understand the properties of it? Well, there are, are two ways to do that. You can either use an ignition oven, which we'll talk about in a little bit, or you can do what's called extraction and recovery of the recycled asphalt pavement. When you're doing this, um, when you're extracting and recovering the wrap, the first thing you want to do is you make sure that you get the moisture content of the wrap as you're testing it. As wrap sits out in the field and it rains, unless the wrap stockpile is covered, there's a very good chance that you'll have some moisture trapped in there. 
And because the wrap is often put into the asphalt drum later than the virgin aggregate, and it's put in later so it's further away from the flame that's within the drum, um, if it's added too early in the asphalt drum, then it could actually burn the wrap. Um, because it's added later, it doesn't get as much drying as the virgin aggregate does. And this is something that you want to mimic in the lab. You want to make sure that you do not, one, burn the wrap. If you heat wrap up too hot, you can actually further oxidize and burn the asphalt cement. And um, you also want to make sure that you get all the moisture out of there. And this can be done by dry, drying the material at about 60 degrees Celsius. Then when you get the asphalt cement from the wrap, you can, as I mentioned, use an ignition oven. And an ignition oven essentially burns all of the asphalt cement off the sample. It gets to very, very high temperatures. Or you can run what's called an extraction. And that's where you use chemicals to pull the asphalt cement off of the aggregate. And you can take that asphalt cement and chemical blend, remove the chemical, and you're left with what's called the extracted asphalt cement. And you can get um, asphalt cement from that in order to test to understand the properties. And then you can also test the aggregates after that. Some of the information that's important for aggregates from the wrap is the gradation. Uh, you want to know what size distribution you have and also the shape of the wrap. And that can include the angularity, uh, the flat and elongated right ratio. Often they have 100% crushed faces because the aggregate has been milled and recrushed. But um, the shape and the gradation are the two most important. Um, in general, the, the informal definition of high wrap is anything um, more than 20%. And when you look at that breakover point, there's a couple different things that you can do. So if you're using less than 20% wrap, the asphalt cement properties of the wrap is not taken into account. That means that that blending of the asphalt cement from the wrap with the virgin asphalt cement does not significantly affect the properties. But if, we, if you use greater than 20% wrap, this is considered the high wrap amount, and the asphalt cement should be extracted and you can extract the asphalt cement from the wrap. You can even blend it with the virgin asphalt cement to determine what your final asphalt cement is anticipated to behave like. And uh, McDaniel and Anderson, this is from the NCHRP 452 report, they put together a nice little table with general rules of thumb. And you can see here that they have uh, three different recommended virgin binder grades. A uh, minus 22 binder, a minus 16 binder, and a minus 10 binder. And by showing your wrap percentage, you can say whether there's no change in the binder selection, if you're supposed to go one grade softer than normal, or if you're supposed to follow the recommendations from the blending charts that they put together. So you can see here if you're using a, for example, a PG 58 minus 28, and you are using 20 to 30 percent wrap, you would then bump that up to a, uh, excuse me, you'd bump that down to a 5228. So if you're using a 5828, you would want a softer asphalt, and you'd go down to a 5228. The example here they have in the table is if you were using a 64 minus 22, you would bump that down to a 58 minus 28. And uh, for the minus 22 binders, you use 20 to 30 percent wrap, bumps that grade one grade softer. If you're using a minus 16 binder, it's 15 to 25 percent. And if you're using a minus 10 grade binder, it's 10 to 15 percent. Now, if you go above those levels, you need to start using the blending charts. And on the next slide, we have some examples of these blending charts. And there's two types of blending charts that they used, and uh, they used both if you know the wrap percentage and if you do not know the wrap percentage. So on the top here, if you're looking at just the high temperature binder grade and you know the wrap percentage is known, you can go from the y-axis, excuse me, you can go from the x-axis here. I'm going to change that to a different color so you can see it. You can go from the x-axis here up to 
whatever your critical temperature is right here, and then extract your line down here. And this is what your new high binder temperature is going to be. So if you're using approximately 30% wrap and you are using a PG64 binder, you'll go down to that um, to the y-axis intercept and you're going to end up with about a 54, a PG54 binder for the high temperature grade. And if your wrap percentage is unknown, you can look at either your 64 or your 70, and you can get right here a range of the percentage of wrap that you expect to see uh, in that mix. So there's two ways of, of dealing with this wrap. You can either use a, a, use a blending chart when you know the percentage or, of wrap, or if you do not know the percentage of wrap. And these blending charts are available for high temperatures, intermediate temperatures, and lower temperatures. To finish up this, this section about the use of wrap in asphalt concrete, there is um, a potential concern for using wrap in warm mix asphalt. And that is because warm mix asphalt is specifically designed to use lower production and construction temperatures. And two things can happen because of this. One, you have um, lower temperatures in your drum. You have lower temperatures during the processing of the material. And there's a potential for extra moisture to enter the mix. As I mentioned, the wrap is generally added later in the drum. And because it's added later in the drum, you are actually uh, decreasing the amount of time the wrap is within the drum, and you're decreasing the um, amount of time that the moisture has in order to potentially evaporate. So some moisture issues can come up. The second is that as you decrease your production and construction temperatures, you may not have the same amount of blending of the existing asphalt cement and the virgin asphalt cement. So the concept of blending the wrap with an, a virgin mixture is that some of the existing asphalt cement on the wrap the older asphalt cement, is what is called activated. And it comes back to life, and that asphalt cement joins the new mixture. And you can use the asphalt cement on the wrap in order to replace adding more virgin asphalt cement. But if you're not heating the materials up as much, then there's a possibility that um, as much asphalt cement will not be activated, and you won't have that blending. And I really don't believe that these two questions have been fully addressed yet. As we're learning more about warm mix asphalt and as we're learning more about wrap, uh, we get better understandings of this. But I don't think there's been any sort of clear resolution to this. So that's just an overview of wrap and asphalt uh, concrete. And now we're going to shift over into using some wrap in the lab. However, if there are any questions now, please raise your hand in the chat box, or raise your hand in the participant list, type the question in the chat box, and um, I'll be happy to answer them. So we'll be moving on now to using recycled asphalt pavement or wrap in the lab. And I'm going to go over actually three reports that you can find online. The first is from NCHRP 752, and that's the Improved Mix Design, Evaluation, and Material Management Practices for Hot Mix Asphalt with High Reclaimed Asphalt Pavement Content. And I placed the link in the chat box. The second article we'll be going over is the evaluation of use of high percentage of reclaimed asphalt pavement for super paved mixes. And this came out of the state of Florida. And that link is down in the chat box. And then finally, the detection of recycled asphalt pavement or wrap in bituminous mixtures. And that came out of Illinois. And the link is there. So you can go ahead and download these three reports if you're interested. I'm just going to briefly go over each one. There's an extremely large amount of good information in those three reports. And I'm just going to kind of hit on the highlights so you have an idea of what's in each one of them. So NCHRP 752 
boiling down about a 200-page report into three bullet points, I talked about three main main uh, deliverables. The first was how to characterize wrap materials for mixed design. The second was mixed designs using high wrap contents. So how do we characterize the wrap, and then how do we adjust and, and perform the mixed designs in the laboratory. And then also they provided some recommendations. And uh, this was put out in 2013, so it's a very uh, recent report. They also believe that high wrap should be more uh, clearly defined. I stated it as about 20%. Some other agencies in some other locations do 25 or even up to 30%. So there's really no standard definition for high wrap usage. They emphasize that good stockpile and good sampling practices are absolutely critical. This makes a lot of sense when we're talking about wrap coming from potentially many different sources, having to be processed in the plant. You want to make sure that you're managing those stockpiles and you're managing how you sample them uh, well. They do believe that current superpaved mixed design rules and, and procedures are applicable to high wrap. You can simply use the wrap as another um, aggregate source. They also believe that the selection of the virgin asphalt binder grade should be based on the true grade of the wrap binder. So they recommend that you take the extracted wrap material, extracted asphalt cement from the wrap, and actually run a PG uh, binder grading regime on that in order to understand the exact grade that you have from the wrap binder. And then also they uh, believe that agencies sh should require moisture damage testing. And again, we've, we've heard a couple times already, but talking about the concept of the wrap not getting as much drying as the virgin aggregate, uh, moisture damage is definitely a concern. So when you're thinking of characterizing the wrap materials for mixed design, they believe that the uh, specific gravity of the existing wrap aggregate is absolutely key, especially when you start getting into the higher wrap content amounts. And there's, they identified three ways that you can uh, recover the aggregate for the specific gravity. The first is the ignition method, and that's AASHTO T308, where you place the sample in an ignition oven. It's heated up very, very hot, and the asphalt cement is burned off, and you're able to then take the aggregate out of the oven and run your specific gravity. You can also run a solvent extraction, which is AASHTO T164. This is where the chemicals pull the asphalt off of the aggregate and you're left with your aggregate sample. And then there's a third, ASHTO T209, is where you can estimate the specific gravity from the maximum specific gravity of the wrap sample. So there's two different ways to get your specific gravity. They recommend that if you are just looking for the asphalt content, use the ignition method. That's the easiest, fastest, and most consistent method. And if you are using your high wrap, you want to recover your wrap binder using your solvent extraction technique so you can determine the true or the continuous binder grade of the wrap material. When you're thinking about how you perform your mix design and if you need any sort of adjustments, you want to, they recommend putting the wrap in the oven at the mixing temperature. Now you saw earlier in the presentation a recommendation of having the wrap going no hotter than 110 degrees Celsius. Here, mixing temperatures can be uh, significantly higher than 110 Celsius. If you're using a, a 58-28, you can get mixing temperatures up to 155 degrees Celsius. So um, within literature, there is not 100% consensus on what to do with the wrap. They here um, in this report said, uh, make sure you're using the mixture temperature, but you do not have the wrap in the oven for more than three hours. If you have the wrap in the oven for more than three hours, you can continue to age that wrap binder, which will change the properties of it. Now, they did several wrap mixtures. And for one of the wrap mixtures, they did use warm mix asphalt. And they found out that reducing that temperature did not affect volumetric properties or TSR, which is tensile strength ratio results. If you recall, one of their recommendations was to do moisture condition or moisture testing on uh, wrap mixtures. And the TSR, the tensile strength ratio, that test compares moisture condition to unmoisture condition samples. And for the one warm mix asphalt, 
uh, mixture that they evaluated with RAP, they found that there weren't any problems with that, which is encouraging. They did find that adding RAP increased stiffness according to dynamic modulus. By adding 25% RAP, the dynamic modulus was anywhere from 30 to 43% higher. And by adding 55% RAP, it was 25 to 60% higher. They found that um, one of the tricky things about the uh, moisture damage test, the tensile strength ratio, is that you take your unconditioned sample, which is just a, a normal asphalt concrete sample that you make in the lab, and you compare that to what's called a conditioned sample, a moisture conditioned sample. And moisture conditioned sample, what you do is you, you take, as, you take a, your asphalt concrete sample, you place it in a bath, place it in a vacuum, and you suck water into that mix to where there's uh, anywhere between, I believe it's 55 and 70% moisture within that mix. Then you run a test on that moisture conditioned sample. So you have both conditioned and unconditioned uh, tensile strengths. The TSR, the tensile strength ratio, is the uh, ratio of the unconditioned and conditioned uh, numbers. And I think I said that backwards. I apologize. The tensile strength ratio is the ratio of the conditioned to the unconditioned strength. Generally, conditioning the sample, introducing that moisture reduces the strength, so your tensile strength ratio drops under 1. And in order to pass the specification, you need to have a tensile strength ratio of above 0 0.80, and that's a ratio of two tensile strengths. Something they found out about this, though, is by using RAP, they increased both the conditioned and the unconditioned strengths. But in the process of raising both the conditions and the unconditioned strength, they actually decreased the ratio. So the TSR fell below 0.8, but they were actually getting higher strengths. So that's something that's always a little complicated using the TSR in a, a specification, is that you can actually get better performance, but the ratio decreases. And they also did some uh, cracking resistance using fracture testing, and they found that adding wrap decreased the fracture or the cracking resistance of the mixtures. So. Um, overall, the mixtures were a little stiffer. They had higher tensile strengths, but the ratio of the condition to the unconditioned was lower, and the uh, cracking resistance using the high wrap was also lower. The uh, next study, this is the study that was done in Florida. They used four different levels of wrap, 0, 25, 35, and 45% wrap, and the highest blend the 45% wrap, they used a softer binder. You can see that for the two highest blends, they used a softer binder. And they used both coarse and fine fractions of the wrap. So uh, down in Florida, they used um, different stockpiles, one which had been further crushed, so they had a coarser fraction and a finer fraction of wrap. They used three different asphalt cement types. They used a, a standard PG67-22 with a 0% wrap. For the 25% wrap, they used a 6422, so you can see that upper binder grade is getting a little softer. And then for the greater than 30% wrap, they used a 5828, so they actually bumped both the high temperature and the low temperature binder grades for the highest percentages of wrap. They used both granite and limestone virgin aggregates, and they designed for 3 to 10 million easels, and their air voids, the VMA, and the VFA were all met with all four of these blends. They ran two performance tests. They ran the asphalt pavement analyzer, which is a writing test. And they also used the superpave IDT, which is a cracking test. For the asphalt pavement analyzer, they showed that the higher rat mixture showed better rut resistance, but they weren't sure if that was due to including the wrap or the fact that they used a a different binder grade. So there were kind of two factors there that they couldn't separate. And they found that the APA measurements correlated well with the servo pack gyratory shear test results. So another area that people are looking into is using your gyratory compactors in order to quantify the compactability of your mixture. So you can measure how much shear needs to be applied when you're compacting a sample. And that can get an indication of the compactability 
or the workability of the mixture. And they found that those measurements from that gyratory shear test correlated well with the asphalt pavement analyzer. For the superpave IDT test, this was looking at fracture energy and your energy ratio. They found that both of these decreased as the percentage of wrap increased. So much like the NCHRP 752 report, as you increase the amount of wrap, your ability to maintain cracking resistance decreases. So those results were from Florida. And Illinois also ran some tests. And what they were actually trying to find out is how can we detect if there's recycled asphalt pavement or wrap in an asphalt mixture. They felt that there was a need to identify and develop methods for quality assurance of HMA with wrap to answer two questions. First, is there wrap in a mix? And two, how much wrap is in the mix? And they actually developed some formalized lab procedures in order to answer these two questions. So they went over a lot of the tests that we have uh, already talked about, and they found that by using the ignition oven, you obviously can't distinguish binder types because all of the binder gets burned off. And you also can't identify if wrap has been in a mixture. They developed a new procedure called the partial extraction procedure. And you can find out more details about that in the full report, which is in the link that I posted in the chat box. And this partial extraction you can actually remove the virgin binder, but they found that traces of the wrap binder is left behind. So by using the partial extraction method, you can identify if there is wrap in the mix. But if you actually want to quantify the amount of wrap, then what you need to do is you need to have a sample of the virgin binder, the mixture that you're investigating, and also a bit of the wrap stockpile material. And by using the DSR, you can use the G star sine delta measurements in order to actually estimate how much wrap you have in the mixture. Obviously, this is a lot more difficult to execute in the field because you need those three different samples, the virgin binder, the mixture you're testing, and also the wrap stockpile. But if you do have access to those three materials, then you're actually able to find out exactly how much wrap you have in the mix. And uh, they developed and formalized these lab procedures from multiple wrap sources across Illinois. Lots of good details in that report as well. So that's a brief overview of a wrap in the lab. We're going to move to wrap in the field. However, if there are any questions, uh, please raise your hand in the participant box and then type the question into the chat box. It looks like we have a, a question being typed, so I'll wait a, a couple of moments. <clears throat> so the question is, can wrap be used again, or does it contaminate all the sources? And that is a, a, a fantastic question. Um, when you, uh, for example, if you take um, an asphalt mixture and you put 90% virgin material and 10% wrap material into that mixture, you're going to blend it all together, and the wrap is going to be dispersed within the new asphalt material. And I think the, the, quite, the interesting question is, if you mill that surface off, you now have uh, an existing road that has 90% virgin material and 10% wrap. You mix that up, you get a new wrap pile, and 10% of that wrap pile is actually reused wrap, so it's kind of wrap squared or, or something along those lines. And as we continue using all of this wrap, we may actually continue to get more and more reused material. And I think um, the, the short answer to the question is yes, you can reuse that material. But I think as we continue to incorporate more wrap into mixes, and as we continue, continue to mill these surfaces and reuse the material once, twice, and possibly three times in the future, this, this uh, continues to drive home the importance of proper stockpile management and proper uh, classification of the materials. And I think that as we continue using these uh, wrap sources and as the wrap gets recycled into mixtures, understanding the properties of the wrap will become more and more important. And understanding how to properly process and how to manage that wrap will become more and more important. 
Um, so yes, RAP can be reused, but I think that um, really the vast majority of, of RAP usage has been within the past 10 years. Uh, uh, you can certainly find RAP and, and states that has been used for the past 30 years, but I think the consistent use and the consistent incorporation of RAP into mixtures has really taken off over the past 10 years. And when you think about a typical life of an asphalt pavement, it's about 10 to 15 years before some sort of maintenance needs to be done. So we're probably just starting to enter the time period where we're going to be milling up surfaces that may have a significant amount of RAP in it. So it'll be uh, certainly interesting to see if we're able to continue reusing and reusing this material, or if over time does it degrade. But uh, excellent question. Uh, now the, the second question is, if we use softer binders in the high wrap percentage, how will we address writing problems? Or should there be other means of control? And I think this is something that Florida touched on. Um, I mentioned in the, uh, a couple slides ago that um, the higher wrap mixture showed better rut resistance. And yes, they were using a softer binder grade, but did that rut resistance correlate with the high wrap content, or did it correlate with the actual binder grade? Because um, one could argue that by dropping down from a 60 minus a 67 minus uh, 22 down to a 58 minus 28, uh, that drop of binder grade did not completely account for the additional stiffness that the wrap put in there. So I think that there are um, <clears throat> potentially, I think there are, are two confounding factors. One, you're changing the wrap content, and two, you're changing the binder grade. And I don't think anyone has yet been able to completely decouple that. So uh, Riyadh, to answer your question, I don't think we know whether the binder grade or the wrap is what's really influencing the rutting resistance or even cracking resistance. And I think that's something that we're going to have to continue to investigate as time moves on. So thank you for those questions. We're going to finish off by uh, talking about some wrap in the field. And then um, if you have questions as I'm going along, feel free to type them into the chat box. And we'll end with uh, questions at the end as well. So just like there were several studies for the lab available, there are also several studies in the field. I tried to pull studies that had free reports online, because I figure if um, people are interested in these uh, reports, it's, it's very nice to be able to get a little more information. So in the field section, we're going to talk a little bit about NCHRP 752, and I already provided the link for that. We're also going to talk about NCHRP report 452, and I just put the link in uh, for that report. You can download the full PDF report. And then also, um, I found a, a very nice report out of the state of Minnesota. If you guys are interested in finding some very nice uh, reports, I want to um, show appreciation to the state of Minnesota. They do an excellent, excellent job of posting all their reports and lots and lots of good information. And they have a very nice report here for the best practices of wrapped use based on field performance. And we'll briefly go over that as well. So for um, NCHRP 752, I've been talking a lot about the importance of quality control at the plant. And here are some actual details on what needs to happen. Uh, first, they recommend that any wrap particles that are greater than two inches in size are screened off. And as you're screening these uh, materials, they also recommend you do not crush to pass a single screen size. So if you're targeting maybe a one inch nominal maximum aggregate size, they do not recommend that you just cycle material constantly through a one inch crusher. Because what will happen is you'll get a very high dust content and you'll really dilute the benefit of using wrap. They recommend instead that you um, step down. So you start with crushing to two inches, then crush to one and a half inches, then crush to one inch. And by stepping down, in theory, you'll be able to get that single screen size, but you're not just putting material back through again and again and creating that high dust content. You need to be very careful watching for contamination. Um, there's a lot of debris from around roads. You might have something like uh, paving fabrics or some sort of uh, like geo grid within there. You want to make sure that's all removed. 
And you also certainly want to watch out for contamination in combined stockpiles, because if you have uh, several different stockpiles, you just increase the amount of chances of something uh, foreign getting into there that you don't want in your processed wrap pile. And they recommend in uh, NCHRP 752 that you sample and test at the same frequency as virgin aggregates, which is once per every 1,000 tons of material used. Now, I do want to say that uh, NCHRP 752 did some review of field sites, and they found that high wrap mixes using either 30 or 50 percent wrap in a mixture did have positive test results in the field. But they didn't go into a whole lot of detail about that. It was more of just kind of an identification and survey of that. And CHRP 452, the number's a little lower, so it came out actually before 752. And they also talked a lot about um, quality control procedures. Uh, here in this report, they actually um, suggested you increase your frequency of sampling compared to traditional version aggregates. So you can see even within NCHRP, there's not 100% consensus on, on how to properly manage aggregate and aggregate stockpiles. But they do say that the frequency depends on the consistency of the wrap, how you're managing the stockpile, the amount of wrap you're processing, and the cost of that sampling, all those type of things as well. Uh, they recommend that as you're uh, sampling your material, you want to verify the binder content and the gradation. I think another thing that you can add here is also verifying the binder type. So go ahead and extract that asphalt cement from the wrap, and you're able to verify that you're getting a consistent added binder grade to your material. And then also, they are very concerned about the moisture content. So just a couple of different reports there from NCHRP, looking a little more at the quality control of plants, ensuring that you're getting a consistent, high-quality product that you can add to your uh, design. Now, from uh, Minnesota, what Minnesota did is they surveyed various different um, highways. And they looked at the fuel performance. So they looked at five different highways here. They looked at a section of I-90, County Highway 4, County Highway 16, County Highway 112, and then State Highway 10. And this is a very nice study as well, because I didn't put this in here, but they actually did a pretty comprehensive survey of Minnesota and its agencies and its counties, seeing who used RAP and what they did. And uh, Matt, I just see you, saw you typed a question in there. I'll finish up with the Minnesota example, and then I'll, I'll get to the question. But thanks for, thanks for providing that. Um, of interest here in this Minnesota report is that they've got a couple mixtures here uh, in the high wrap content, around the 20 to 30 percent wrap content. And you can see these were paved anywhere between 1997 and 2006. And this report was performed in 2009. And overall, they found that all mixtures that contain wrap performed acceptably in terms of rutting. They found that the high temperature PG grade was related to rut resistance. So while there was um, no correlation between the percentage of wrap and rutting, they did find that the high stiffness of the wrap asphalt cement may contribute to rutting resistance. They found only a moderate relationship between percent wrap and the onset of early thermal cracking. So we talked a little bit about different fracture tests, which are able to quantify cracking. And most of those laboratory tests found that as you increase the wrap content, you're increasing the susceptibility to cracking. But Minnesota found that they didn't have a very strong relationship between the percent wrap and the onset of thermal cracking. And then finally, they found that the low temperature grade and percentage of new binders was strong, strongly related to early performance. So what sort of low temperature grade? If you're in Minnesota, you're very concerned about those low temperatures. What sort of low temperature grade do you use, whether it's a minus 22, a minus 28, minus 34, or even a minus 40? That and the percentage of the new binder was related to the early performance. So they felt that it was possible to address low temperature performance during the design phase by adjusting this low temperature binder grade and adjusting the uh, percentage of new binders regardless of what wrap level you put in. So some good findings there from Minnesota. So in summary, uh, when I'm done with the next couple slides, I'm going to address uh, Matt's question. 
But for logistics, I'll email out the professional development hours no later than Friday, March 7th. And also at that time when you get the professional development hours, you're going to um, also be able to look at um, the rewatch the pavement art and download the the presentation on the website. So when you get your PDHs, you'll be able to rewatch and download it. I'm also looking for topic suggestions. I don't have any topic suggestions for the fall yet. So if, if no one suggests anything, you're at my mercy. And, and who knows what I'll want to dig into next fall. I always find it interesting to, to kind of learn about new topics. But um, I really do want to provide a service to the community. So anything you guys want to hear about, I'll I'll be more than willing to dig into and give it my best shot. And our next paving hour will be Tuesday, April 1st. And that is not an April Fool's joke. It will be on Tuesday, April 1st. And I'll be looking at wide base tires, AKA super singles, and how those affect your pavement performance. So we talked about high levels of recycled asphalt pavement in asphalt concrete. And we're getting close to 1 o'clock, but I have a couple questions. So I'll hang around as long as you guys want to. But I'll start out with Matt's question. And Matt's question is, will crack seal material change wrap characteristics? And this is an excellent question, Matt. And I think it's a, a function of how much crack seal material is uh, actually being pulled up. So if you look at some roads, you got crack sealing every foot, every two feet. I think then you will start to see a pretty significant effect of that crack sealing mixture in, in the wrap materials. Um, now, if, if you're only sealing every 20 feet or something, it'll probably kind of come out in the wash and you really won't notice that. And what's important to do with this, though, is to go back to your um, proper sampling technique and proper evaluation technique. So if you're sampling that material and you know there's a high level of crack sealant material in there, you want to make sure that you are taking some of that crack sealing material and trying to get the proper ratio of crack sealing material to overall wrap material. Then as you run those extractions, that crack sealant and the properties of that crack sealant will get pulled out with the, um, the wrap material. So I think that with enough crack seal material or really enough of any sort of um, um, pavement maintenance or pavement re rehabilitation product, you can see that influence the, um, the wrap material. Um, the next question from Todd, are you looking at any 100% wrap scenarios in your research? I produce 100% wrap in Northeast Market, and I'm currently working with the New York DOT evaluating 100% for regular use, uh, but do not see any discussion of percentages higher than 50%. And that's an excellent question, Todd, and I think that a lot of places are looking at using 100% wrap, especially in areas where you have a tremendously large amount of wrap stockpiled. And when you start getting into 100% wrap, you're starting to get into almost a, a cold in place, a CIR type evaluation technique. And I've, I've given a couple percent, um, I've given a couple presentations on pavement rehabilitation. And if you look at some of those flexible pavement rehabilitation presentations and look at the cold in place recycling, that's the sort of material you're starting to get into. And whether or not you choose to use an asphalt emulsion to bind together that CIR, or you choose to use a hot asphalt cement, I think that you're starting to look into having to deal with a material that is 100% recycled and having to really take into account how that asphalt cement on the wrap interacts with the material. Um, so you're, you're absolutely correct. I didn't cover anything over 50%. I have heard um, talk about over 100%. But that, that starts getting into um, kind of the cold in place recycling. And that, that could be a potential topic of its own because we're trying to kind of bridge these different technologies and these different methodologies into one successful mix design. Um, the next question from um, Matt is, please discuss the term percent wrap. And he says that in Missouri, the specifications are in terms of effective binder replacement. And one needs to be sure that they understand the term and how percent is defined. And Matt, that is, or excuse me, Mike, that is an excellent point. And um, that's something that I probably should have spent a slide kind of defining. And when we're talking about percent wrap, we're talking about percent aggregate rate. Excuse me, percent aggregate weight. 
So if you have one ton of aggregate and you're using 20% wrap, that means that you have, oh boy, I shouldn't use one ton. Uh, that means you have 1,600 pounds of virgin aggregate and you have 400 pounds of wrap. And that 400 pounds of wrap includes both aggregate and the asphalt cement that is on that wrap. And in Missouri, they use effective binder replacement. And what they're talking about there is that as you mix the wrap into the um, hot, or as you mix the wrap into the aggregate, the virgin aggregate and the virgin asphalt cement, 100% of the binder from the wrap does not get mixed with the new virgin material. Um, and um, that's something that I didn't dig into a whole lot. But there is a certain percentage of wrap material that does not get activated and that kind of remains a hard asphalt cement. So when you're looking at effective binder replacement, what they're looking for there is how much binder are you actually getting off of the wrap that is replacing the virgin asphalt material. So a very good point that's, that's very important. Um, and then we've got another question from Shannon, and that question is, when we're grading the asphalt cement extracted from the wrap samples, can we skip the RTFO and PAV aging and go straight to the BBR to determine the bottom temp for the wrap AC? And Shannon, that's an excellent question, and I actually have, I do not know what the answer is. Um, when you're extracting the wrap, you get the asphalt cement, and you're asking, does you need, do you need to, um, I'll have to look into that. Um, so, Shannon, I apologize. I'm going to make a note, and I will send you an email about that. But I'm not 100% sure. Now, Eric from the Ohio DOT says you assume it is virgin since it's going in with the new mix. So, um, Shannon, Ohio DOT, and thank you, Eric, for, for piping in. That's one of the nice things about all having all of you on the on here is that I'm, I guarantee you a lot of you know a lot more about this than I do. But um, according to Ohio, you do need to RTFO and PAV the material in order to do the BBR. But uh, that's actually, that's a fascinating question, and um, that's something that I'm going to dig into more. Um, the next question is, and just so everyone knows, I realize it's after 1 o'clock. Like I said, I'll be more than happy to stick around as long as you want, but I would completely understand if you had to get going. Um, the next question is, is wrap useful in CMA? And I assume CMA is cold mix asphalt. And that goes back a lot to um, Mike's question about 100% wrap. Because, yes, uh, kind of by definition, cold mix asphalt um, can be, like if it's in place, cold in place asphalt, is a type of cold mix asphalt, and that is 100% wrap. And I think that if you're using it in cold mix asphalt, like stockpiling over the winter so you can place it down, unless you mix that with a hotter asphalt material, you're not going to activate any of the asphalt that's on the wrap. So using it at ambient temperatures only, you're not going to get any sort of effective binder replacement, as the Missouri question came up. You're just going to be able to use it as an aggregate. So yes, you can use it as an aggregate, but you're not going to get the benefits of any sort of blended asphalt coming out of it. Um, going down the list here, again, thank you to Eric for um, clearing up Shannon's question. You assume that the asphalt cement that's extracted from the wrap is virgin, and then you put it through the RTFO and the PAV aging, like you would any uh, normal binder. Um, and Shannon added on, yes, the asphalt cement from the wrap is aged, but at least in Ohio, they um, they continue putting it through the aging procedure because that is what's going to happen to it in the future in the field anyway. So they want to make sure that the, the mix they're evaluating goes through the aging in the lab that's going to happen then in the field. Uh, the next question from Andrew is, can wrap be used in treatments other than hot mix and warm mix, such as slurry seals, microsurfacing, and other surface treatments? Are any states doing this? Um, slurry seals, microsurfacing, 
and surface treatments. For slurry seals and microsurfacing, those usually tend to use a, um, a much finer mix. And I think that the benefits of wrap for using in asphalt applications comes from using the larger aggregate sizes. So you have a nice hard aggregate particle that has a lot of asphalt coating it. And as you get smaller and smaller, it becomes more dusty, and the asphalt cement becomes less valuable because you're increasing your surface area so much with the added dust that you're not really getting the benefits of having that additional asphalt cement. Um, so I haven't seen wrap being used in uh, treatments other than hot mix or warm mix, like those that you were talking about, um, because of that reason, and the second reason is, is that you're often using ambient temperatures like emulsions with slurry seals and microsurfacing and surface treatments. So you're not getting the benefit of the wrap, which is that contained asphalt cement. Oh, and then um, uh, Irv Ducats, thank you, Irv, for, for pitching in. He says is that the BR, the blending ratio, gives a better description of the actual amount of binder coming from a particular wrap source. That's a very good comment, Irv, and I agree 100%, because if you're assuming 20% wrap by weight of aggregate, you do not know how much of the binder of that wrap is actually being uh, used and activated and replacing virgin asphalt cement. But if you're using your uh, binder ratio, then you know exactly how much asphalt cement you're using. And then one uh, final comment from Judith Shaw is that there could be a follow-up um, on this, and that is something that I'd be more than willing to do. So what I will do is I'll go through these uh, comments and a lot of the questions, especially the ones that I kind of stumbled on, and that'll be the first pavenar of fall 2014 will be kind of digging deeper into RAP. And that's actually a, a decent title as well. And we'll, we'll kind of start looking into these, and I, I might be contacting some of you for your personal experiences. But um, yeah, this, I think this will be a good, a good topic for, for the fall. So with that, thank you very much. And I will um, see you guys all on April 1st. Hope you have a wonderful week and a wonderful rest of the month. Take care.